Boa tarde a todos. Vamos dar continuidade à apresentação do professor Richard Wish. É uma honra poder apresentá-lo aqui, apresentar uma pessoa que, na verdade, dispensa apresentações. Né? Mas, para não me furtar a formalidade dessa apresentação, só mencionar que o professor Richard Wish é emeritus professor da, da King's College, é, lecionou por, por anos na, na, na universidade, de 91 a 2013, ele tem sido reconhecido uh, em, diversas, em diversos países pela sua contribuição para o direito da concorrência, não somente pelas suas obras e artigos, uh, muitos dos quais, muitas obras das quais viram manuais de universidades de diversos países, mas também pela contribuição que ele tem dado para diversos governos e autoridades concorrenciais, uh, ajudando na, na implementação de um sistema concorrencial ou na, ou na, ou na revisão desses sistemas. Uh, em 2011, ele recebeu um prêmio da, da GCR, do Global Competition Review, pra, por a, a sua excelência acadêmica. E, mais recentemente, em 2014, ele foi nomeado Queen's Council Honoris Causa, uh, que são aqueles prêmios dados por contribuições relevantes à, à lei de England and Wales, uh, fora dos tribunais. Né? O professor vai, vai discorrer sobre um, um tema bastante quente, né? uh, que nós um pouco à distância temos acompanhado, mas tenho certeza que grande parte desse desse, desse auditório acompanha, uh, que é o tema de conduta unilateral na, na era do e-commerce, mais especificamente falando sobre o caso uh, Intel. Então, o professor vai fazer a sua apresentação e depois, ao final, nós vamos abrir uh, um tempinho para perguntas. Tenho certeza que ele vai fazer uma apresentação bastante alegre, principalmente tendo em vista que a Inglaterra acaba de eliminar o Brasil no, no, no Campeonato Mundial Sub-17. Então, acho que ele deve estar bastante feliz com isso. Professor, o palco é seu. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bruno. Uh, again, as I've already said, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, and I was asked if I would give um, an address on a topic uh, this evening. And I offered uh, Eduardo two. I said, well, I could talk about uh, unilateral effects and the recent Intel judgment. And I said, I could also talk about e-commerce. And so I sent two presentations, one on Intel and one on e-commerce. And then I arrived here today to look at the title of my talk. And it's unilateral conduct in the age of e-commerce. So apparently I have to merge the two topics <laughs> into one, um, which reminded me of a, a brilliant opera by Richard Strauss called Ariadne auf Naxos. I don't know how many of you know it. Uh, an aristocrat decides to have an entertainment at his castle one evening and he'll have a comic opera and then a serious opera and then he'll have the fireworks at the end. And so the two opera groups rehearse their respective operas. And then the um, aristocrat realizes that people aren't that interested in opera and they prefer the fireworks. So he tells the singers that they have to sing their two comic and opera uh, series simultaneously. And it is one of the most brilliant operas you can ever imagine. Um, but I'm not going to do one slide of Intel and then one slide of e-commerce. I, I, I really think that would get confusing. I'm actually going to limit myself to Intel, I think, because this is a major judgment of our Court of Justice um, just from a few weeks ago. Um, it is on the very, very controversial subject within the law of unilateral behavior. When can it be unlawful for a dominant firm to offer a rebate? And this has been controversial in Europe, I would say, for 35 to 40 years. Um, European law on rebates is undoubtedly in a very different position from United States law. So there's a kind of a chasm as wide as the Atlantic Ocean between uh, the US and the EU. And then this very subject became the critical question in the Intel case. Um, and I think it's worthwhile spending a fair bit of time on it. What did the Court of Justice decide? What did it not decide? And then more generally, what does this case have to say about, if you like, 
per se rules and the rule of reason? What kind of competition rules do we want to have? And I'm aware that that's a very live debate in Brazil in the world of agreements. Um, you haven't had so many cases on unilateral behavior, but it's also a live question in the world of unilateral behavior. So let's see how we uh, get on. Um, <clears throat> The judgment of the Court of Justice was handed down on the 6th of September, um, and it dealt with three different questions. One is the rebates question, a separate question, which I will discuss if there's time, but there might well not be time, is that this case raised a very interesting jurisdictional question, which is that even if Intel, this dominant firm, I will sometimes refer to Domco, meaning the dominant company, the dominant undertaking. The translators asked me, what is this word Domco? They have been Googling it, looking it up in dictionaries. <laughs> so I realized maybe I need to explain that's what I mean by Domco, the dominant firm. Even if the rebates that Intel was offering were unlawful, some of these rebates were offered by Intel in California to Lenovo, an OEM manufacturer of uh, hardware in China, incorporating Intel chips produced in Taiwan. So there's obviously an interesting jurisdictional question there. Even if the rebates are unlawful, what has it got to do with the European Commission? How can it have jurisdiction over that kind of commercial relationship. If there's time, I'll say a few words about it. And anyway, my slides, which will be made available to you, uh, deal with it. <clears throat> there's also a procedural issue uh, in Intel about uh, the way the Commission does or does not uh, keep evidence, but probably that'll be too detailed for now. What is this case actually all about? So it goes back to 2009, when the Commission adopted a decision uh, in which it held that Intel was guilty of offering rebates to its customers um, and that these rebates were abusive uh, under Article 102 of the treaty and Intel was fined 1.06 billion euros. Now, an interesting point just to make at this stage is that who was the complainant in this case? AMD of the United States, complaining against Intel of the United States, and essentially arguing that Intel had adopted a worldwide strategy, which was to always keep AMD in its place. In rough terms, Intel had 80% of a market, AMD had 20% of the market, Intel wanted to keep AMD at its 20%. It didn't want it to grow, achieve economies of scale, economies of scope. Who knows if they had done so one day, AMD might have toppled Intel from its perch. So the AMD argument is that Intel strategically are offering rebates to customer, customers in order to always keep us in our position. And the United States decided not to pursue that complaint. But of course, AMD and Intel are competing internationally. And AMD can go to other competition authorities elsewhere in the world. And the um, Taiwanese authority picked it up and took action against Intel. The Japanese authority took it up, took action against Intel. So the States has done nothing. The East Asian authorities have intervened and fined. What does Europe do? And all this time, this case had been in the filing cabinet of the Commission. Were they going to do anything with it? Were they going to reject it? Were they going to run with it? And eventually, they decided to run with it. They found that the rebates in question were unlawful, and they imposed the fine, as I say, of 1.06 billion. Um, it is worth adding that in the original Commission decision, Intel was not accused only of offering these rebates. It, the Commission also found that the AMD chips could be used to um, run the tablets that by now were coming onto the market. 
And so AMD was going to producers of uh, tablets and saying, why not install our chips? And then those OEMs would sell the tablets through retailers in Europe. And there was evidence that Intel went direct to the retailers and said, we will pay you money if you agree not to handle tablets that operate on competing chips. So a straightforward payment to a retailer not to handle competing products. That's very different from simply incentivizing a customer to buy more of my chips. This is actually paying somebody not to handle uh, these products. And so the commission said that was a naked restriction of competition. Um, one didn't really need any kind of analysis of that. It's just obvious that that was unlawful. If you like, that was a per se infringement. And I think with this case, one always has to bear in mind any authority looking at a case will look at the totality of the behavior. Uh, there is this sort of sense of the smell test. Is there something about this behavior that smells bad? Um, I always wondered with Intel, if they'd not been offering the naked payments to retailers, would the case of smelt as bad if you are only looking at the rebates? I mean, we can never know the answer to that, but I do say it is part of the overall context of the case. Anyway, so the commission said that these rebates were unlawful. The commission in its decision said, there's lots of law in Europe that says, if you offer rebates to a customer and you're dominant, if you offer rebates in return for exclusivity, that's unlawful. There was plenty of jurisprudence that said that. Now, a lot of people didn't like that jurisprudence because they said it was too formalistic, too per se, where's the economic analysis that we should be doing in these cases? And the commission in its decision said, well, according to the law, what you're doing, Intel, is illegal, and we don't need to demonstrate effects. But then the commission said, but actually, we're going to demonstrate effects anyway. That's an important point because of what comes later. The commission says, according to the law, we don't have to do an effects analysis, but we're going to do an effects analysis anyway. And having done an effects analysis, we're happy that we can demonstrate that this behavior had a foreclosure effect. So that's the commission's decision. It then gets appealed to the general court in Luxembourg and the general court handed down a judgment in 2014. And it said, well, this business of rebates, it's all very difficult. Um, and the law is quite confusing, but we think, we the general court think we can see a pattern in the jurisprudence. First of all, there are pure quantity rebates. If you buy 1,000 widgets, the price is X. If you buy 2,000 widgets, the price is X minus one. That's a pure quantity rebate, nothing wrong with that. So let's call that per se legal. Well, that's uncontroversial, let's park that over there. Then the general court said there are two other types of rebate. There's a rebate where Domco offers the rebate in return for exclusivity. If you buy exclusively from me, I'm going to give you a rebate. Exclusive for these purposes means exclusive or nearly, or nearly exclusive, let's say 80% or more. So this is a slightly unusual meaning of exclusive. Exclusive means if you buy 80% or more, that's an exclusivity rebate. And the general court said that's illegal unless Domco can show an economic efficiency justification for the rebate. And in this case, the general court said these were exclusivity rebates. Intel didn't propose any efficiency justification. Therefore, these rebates were illegal. Okay, so that was the conclusion in the general court's judgment. These were exclusivity rebates. There was no efficiency justification. Therefore, we uphold the commission. Intel said, yes, but the commission did conduct an effects analysis, and we think they did it badly. We think they did it wrong. Uh, so please, general court, review 
the Commission's rejection of our effects analysis. And the General Court in Intel said, there's no need to do effects analysis. The Commission had you, you were guilty anyway. There was no need for effects analysis. Therefore, we, the General Court, are not going to conduct a judicial review of what the Commission had done. Okay? Um, so that's what the General Court had said. And there was universal reaction against this judgment. Uh, and generally speaking, the criticism was, we've moved generally in competition policy globally. We believe now in economic analysis. We believe that you shouldn't be operating on the basis of per se rules. You should always have to conduct some kind of effects analysis. And what the General Court has done in Intel is to um, reinforce the per se nature of the rule against exclusivity rebates. So there was huge opposition to this judgment. Uh, I can remember going to um, uh, a conference in Singapore and a very good friend of mine who was in this case, an economist, was asked to present on Intel and he said, we have returned to the mi Middle Ages. We're back in about 1432. The lawyers have taken over the mental asylum yet again. Um, I, I mean, the, the, the opposition to this judgment was incredible. Um, and then we go on to um, the, um, th there was also this discussion of jurisdiction and evidence. I won't bother with that. So Intel then take the fight on to the Court of Justice. Now, as many of you know, in our system, when a case reaches the top court of uh, the EU, uh, an advocate general is appointed. And he or she will, with a team of three or four very clever referendaires, will research the law and write an opinion advising the Court of Justice which way to go. And we have an advocate general in Europe at the moment, Niels Wahl, the Swedish advocate general, who is himself an experienced competition lawyer, taught it at the University of Stockholm for many years. And Niels Wahl delivered his opinion in this case in 2016. And if he had been the professor at Stockholm University marking the exam paper of the general court, this was just a flat fail. It didn't even get two marks for good handwriting. It was just zero, appalling. I, I have never seen such an excoriating opinion in my life in which he said, everything is wrong about this. It's per se, it's mechanistic, it's medieval, um, and uh, the judgment should be overturned and nobody should ever look at it again. Um, and that was interesting. I've never seen an opinion go quite so far in one direction. Um, and for the purposes of this judgment, the Court of Justice decided to hear the case as a grand chamber. So you can have 15 judges. If a case is important enough, then 15 judges can uh, sit and hear the case. It's the rugby union formation. Rugby union teams have 15 players. So this was the Court of Justice in rugby union uh, formation, uh, meaning, of course, they knew how important this case was. They knew that the whole world, and I mean literally the whole world, was waiting to see which way was the Court of Justice uh, going to go. Um, and I had a feeling that possibly Niels Wahl by pushing the court so far in one direction might possibly have caused the court to go in completely the opposite direction and to settle for conservatism. You know, the Newtonian principle of every, to every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So I did kind of wonder whether um, the Advocate General might have gone too far, and then we get the judgment. Um, and the court rejected the appeal on jurisdiction. I'll discuss that if there's time at the end. Rejected the judgment, uh, the appeal on procedure, but was critical of the general court. I mean, the headline point about this case is that the judgment that I'm about to describe contained no criticism of the commission. 
it actually criticized the general court on the basis that the commission had conducted an effects analysis. Intel said that that analysis was wrong, appealed to the general court, and the general court said, well, the commission didn't need to do effects analysis, therefore we're not going to judicially review what they did do. And what the Court of Justice has said, I'm sorry, that is a dereliction of your duty. If the Commission has tabled a reasoned decision containing economic analysis, then your job as a court is to review that analysis. So actually, what this case does in technical terms is simply to remit the case back to the General Court to say, conduct a proper judicial review. So it does have to be said, as and when you hear about this case, it is perfectly possible in the end that the Commission will win this case. Because what the General Court might do is to review the Commission's effects analysis and then say it was perfectly okay. So this story is not yet over. The Commission might yet actually win the case. But what is interesting is what the case actually says about rebates. That's what we really want to know. And about per se rules, uh, rule of reason, effects analysis, and so on. And uh, the judgment, it's a remarkable judgment for something as important as it is. It's a slimline judgment. I mean, there's not much here. It's only about 15 pages altogether. And any judgment of the Court of Justice, the first eight pages say hello, and the last two say <laughs> goodbye. Uh, so, uh, so there's not, it doesn't take long to read this. And some of the judgment is on jurisdiction and some of it is on procedure. The bit on rebates is very, very short, actually. Um, and it has a couple of paragraphs, 133, 134, um, that, as it were, talk about what is Article 102, what is unilateral behaviour law, what is it there to achieve? Is it there to protect little competitors from big competitors? Or is it there, as it were, to protect the process of competition? Because if you have a process of competition, people win and people lose. And if you lose, it's not nice. But you went into the boxing ring and you have to bear the consequences. If you go and fight Mike Tyson and he hits you harder than anybody else and there's a pile of blood and teeth splattered around the auditorium, I mean, that is fair competition. He did once bite Evander Holyfield's ear. Now, that, that was probably an abuse of um, the rules of boxing, but um, there is such a thing as losing competition on the merits. And in 133, 134 of this judgment, the court is absolutely emphatic that 102 is not there to protect inefficient competitors. It is to protect the process of competition. And if X, if Domco X defeats Y on the merits, that's okay, that's absolutely fine. Now, the Court of Justice has repeatedly said that in recent years, um, and so I think at that kind of theological level, I think the Court of Justice is absolutely clear this is not about protecting competitors as such, it's the process of competition. That is a studied reaction to the accusations that we've had from the United States over 25 years, that we in Europe protect competitors, they protect competition. I remember Tom Barnett saying that at the Fordham conference just after the Microsoft decision years ago, a sort of a scripted uh, line that he had, you in Europe protect competitors, we protect competition. Well, I just don't believe that. I think we are aligned uh, with the US that this is about efficient competitors. So those paragraphs say, I think, what needs to be said. But then we come on to the bit on rebates the specific horrible topic of rebates. And what I find really fascinating about this is, in this judgment, there are four paragraphs on rebates. That's all it is, 137 to 140. And um, paragraph 137 simply repeats the old rule from Hoffman LaRoche in 1979, that says if Domco offers exclusivity rebates, basically that's unlawful. That is the old, per se, hardline, mechanistic rule that people dislike so much. So paragraph 137 
preserves the rule that everyone hates. So that's a little bit dismal, a little bit disappointing. And then you get, possibly at the moment, my favourite paragraph in all of competition law, which is paragraph 138, and it's short, and there you have it. I've even put some blue in. Um, however, that case law, Hoffman La Roche, must be further clarified. Do you remember earlier I said about how philosophy comes into this? What is the difference between overruling and clarification? Um, this overrules Hoffman La Roche, but it doesn't, they're not allowed to overrule themselves, so they clarify the law. And the way they clarify it is to say that case law must be clarified in the case where the undertaking concerned, Domco, submits during the administrative procedure on the basis of supporting evidence that its conduct was not capable of restricting competition and in particular of producing the alleged foreclosure effects. So in theoretical terms, a competition authority in Europe now faced with an exclusivity rebate, could say in a statement of objections, Hoffman La Roche, that's illegal, paragraph 137. In a sense, that's all a statement of objections needs to say, because 137 preserves Hoffman La Roche. But then 138 says, yes, but now Domco can come along with supporting evidence to say, yes, but that rebate couldn't have any foreclosure effect. And what 139 then says is, if Domco comes along with that supporting evidence, I say in brackets, what Domco in the world will not come along with supporting evidence? Of course, they go straight to Compass Lexicon, um, CRA, RBB, Oxera, write us a story of no foreclosure. Of course they'll do it. And having done it, the commission then has to address that argument. And paragraph 139 says that in doing so, the Commission must analyse the extent of the undertaking's dominant position on the relevant market, the share of market covered by the challenged practice. Was this just one contract with a little customer? Or was it lots of contracts with big customers, thereby potentially foreclosing a huge segment of the market? Uh, what are the conditions and terms of the rebates? What was their duration? What was their amount? Is there any evidence of an actual strategy to exclude AMD? You have to look at all of these different things as economic indicia of whether there are likely to be effects. So in other words, what this judgment does is to say there, do, there does have to be effects analysis. And no sensible competition authority is ever going to say, I rely on Hoffman La Roche. Now let's sit back and wait for the supporting evidence. You'll get your reprisal in first. So de facto, the competition authority does have to do effects analysis. Um, and I think it, this is really quite remarkable because the law of um, rebates in Europe has been stranded for the last 25 years. Everyone has known it wasn't in the right place but somehow nobody knew what to do about it. And they didn't know what to do about it, in particular because of the Hoffman La Roche judgment, which says that these rebates are illegal. And then I, my analogy is, it's like some ocean going ship that for years and years and years used to sail around the world. And then 25 years ago, it went into shallow water and got stuck on some rocks. And for 25 years, the ship has just been stranded on the rocks it didn't sink, but it didn't go anywhere. It was just basically useless to everybody. And then at some point recently, a huge wave has come along, lifted the ship up off the rocks. It didn't sink. It's damaged. It needs repair, but it's moving again. And my submission is that paragraph 138 is that wave. It has lifted the ship off the rocks, and now what we've got to do is to work out in the future what does this actually mean in practice. Now, this judgment has changed the law. It does introduce an effects test into the system. I'll pass over... Um, oh, I, I'm sorry, there is that paragraph. I meant to put that there. Um, 
we'll move on to what this actually now means um, in practice. Um, as I say, Hoffman La Roche is preserved, paragraph 137, but it is clarified. Every Domco in the world will argue effects, and so it means that uh, de facto effects analysis is now part of rebates law. The Commission has an open case against Qualcomm, whom it accuses of contractually offering exclusivity rebates to a major customer. And the Commission has had to sit and wait to know what to do with the Qualcomm case because it had to await the outcome of the Intel judgment. Well, of course, the Intel judgment now says effects analysis are required, basically. And I happen to know from public uh, submissions to the SEC in the States that the customer in question to whom Qualcomm is offering those rebates is a small and medium-sized enterprise by the name of Apple. So the contract in question is Qualcomm's chips that it supplies to Apple because one of the questions is going to be, could this contract have a foreclosure effect on the market? Well, if the customer is Apple, it's obviously an easier case than if it was some much smaller uh, entity. So we now have to wait to see um, what comes of that particular uh, case. Um, one of the interesting things that the economists in particular are debating is, yes, there has to be effects analysis in rebates cases, but what kind of effects analysis? What paragraph 138 says is that uh, Donco can produce supporting evidence. What it does not say is that the Commission has to undertake an as efficient competitor sense in the technical sense of that term. You can say that 102 is about protecting efficient competitors at a kind of a theoretical level, but how do you actually do cases? If you're doing a case on predatory pricing and you're saying we're trying to work out whether Domco could eliminate an as efficient competitor, the way you do that is to say, well, is Domco covering its own costs? Because if it's selling at a loss, then how could somebody as efficient as it survive in a market? Because nobody can survive in a market making a loss. So you really do implement the as efficient competitor test in predation cases by undertaking price cost analysis. Query, does this judgment say that in a rebates case, you have to undertake price cost analysis. Because in a rebate case, that is an exceedingly difficult thing to do. And I think, as I read this judgment, there's nothing in the judgment that says that the commission must do that kind of technical AEC analysis. The case comes down to whatever supporting evidence uh, there has to be. Um, it's just that whatever evidence Domco comes up with, the Commission has to uh, react to. Um, the Intel case does not say at any point whatsoever that the Commission must undertake price cost analysis. There was a judgment about three years ago called Post Denmark II, which was also on rebates. And in that case, the court explicitly addressed the question of whether a rebates case required price cost analysis. And the Court of Justice explicitly said, no, it does not. There is no legal requirement to do AEC analysis. What the Court of Justice said was, if the Commission wants to do AEC analysis, it can do. It is one tool among others but that there was no legal requirement um, to do it. So as the final bullet point says, post Damak II says such a test should not be ruled out in principle. Um, it's one tool amongst others. Um, and in the post-Danmark case, the court said that on the in the circumstances of that case, the AEC test would never be satisfied anyway, because that was a case in the utility sector 
postal services, where the Donco was the incumbent postal operator in Denmark, historically state-owned, never, the network was never built up according to market principles. Um, there would never be a second postal operator in Denmark with the nationwide reach that Post Denmark had. And in that case, the court recognized that that was a kind of market where you would never have an as efficient competitor. In that sort of sector, you won't get one. Um, and I, I mention that specifically because there are people now wondering whether Intel by implication overrules Post Denmark too. And my answer to that is I'm sure that it does not. More specifically, the judge rapporteur that wrote the Intel judgment is the same man that wrote the Post Denmark II judgment three years ago. And he's a clever man. And I can't believe that he's overruled himself within three years. And I have no evidence that he's suffering from amnesia. Um, I think these two judgments are meant to and do uh, fit uh, together. So what it means in the end is that this, this judgment has changed things, it has introduced effects analysis, uh, that's my point about the, um, the wave that's lifted the ship off the rocks, there's no single test for determining uh, unlawfulness. I do think that if the if you were to do an as efficient competitor test, if it was really possible to look at Domco with this rebate system. I think if you were to look at its rebates and you could get the data and you could analyze them and demonstrate that those rebates do imply below cost selling, I would think that in that case, the competition authority can just say guilty. I would say that pricing below Lyric will mean guilty in the same way that pricing below Lyric in a predatory pricing case is likely to mean guilty. So there's an unsafe harbour. But the interesting question with Intel is, what if Domco offers rebates, the Commission does an AEC test, and the rebate leaves the price above Lyric? Interesting question. Does that provide a safe harbour? Is it then possible to say, because your prices are above Lyric, therefore you're acting lawfully? And I would say, according to Post Denmark II, no, because that was a specific case where the court recognized the possibility of, of illegality above Lyric. So it's quite nuanced, this stuff. Okay, the facts of Post Denmark II were very special, utility sector, et cetera, et cetera, but I don't think there's a safe harbor um, above uh, Lyric. Uh, some of you will be familiar with the debate in Europe that we have this, the Commission published this guidance paper on Article 102 enforcement priorities uh, in 2009. And that was the Commission itself trying to introduce a more effects-based approach to abuse of dominance cases. And that paper has led to lots of controversy. Does the Commission really apply it? Is it consistent with the law? Is it a statement of the law? Is it simply a statement of administrative prioritization? What is that paper? And I mean, there have been PhDs written on that subject. Um, my feeling is that the Commission's enforcement guidance paper comes out of Intel very well. Because throughout that paper, the Commission says it's not about protecting inefficient competitors, it's about protecting efficient competitors, 133, 134 of the judgment. We do want to do effects analysis, and these are the kind of criteria that we will use in determining effects. How dominant is Domco? How extensive is the market reach of the practice in question? Was there evidence of an exclusionary strategy? That is paragraph 139 of the guidance paper. So without the court ever saying so, I think the guidance paper has inspirited this judgment. So I think the guidance paper is actually alive uh, and well, and it's a very interesting, you know, th 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 it's a broader question. 
the output of authorities, can the output of authorities influence courts? Well, of course it can influence courts if it's good, if it's intellectually sustainable, if it makes sense, if the travel of direction is the right one, the court will pick it up. And to my mind, the court um, has picked it up. And I think I'm going to stop at that point uh, and find out whether people have any questions or comments about that. I mean, I can talk about these other issues like jurisdiction and whatever, but the rebates thing is at the heart of it all, okay? Bom, uh, antes de abrir para perguntas, eu gostaria de fazer a, a primeira pergunta. Eu acho que é muito interessante uh, esse julgamento aqui para nós. Uh, um, conduto unilateral não tem sido algo uh, que está no topo das prioridades da, da nossa autoridade nos últimos anos. Tá? Porque nós tínhamos, obviamente, tantos outros desafios. Mas, inclusive, eu acho que... Uh, o novo superintendente-geral já deu até, inclusive, declarações de que deve, isso deve ser uh, uh, uma das prioridades da, da, da autoridade no, no, nos próximos anos. Então, acho que é muito importante essa discussão para a gente. Nós temos, sim, algumas, algumas expressões de, uh, da, conduta por, da aplicação da, de conduta por objeto, né, que é muito similar à, à construção europeia, para a fixação de preço de revenda aqui no Brasil. Né. Uh, eu acho que uma, uma, uma coisa bastante importante desse julgamento é que deixa bastante claro para a gente que uh, tem, tem dois passos aqui. Né? Uma primeira é uh, a autoridade uh, europeia que entende que a, a conduta por objeto ela simplesmente ela reverte o ônus probatório e permite uma discussão de uh, eficiência, uh, que eu acho hum. que é, é muito importante isso para a gente, para a gente aplicar isso para o nosso cenário aqui. E aí uma pergunta que eu, que eu gostaria de fazer é, é, é... Eu tenho várias dúvidas sobre esse, esse effect test. <risos> né? uh, mas é possível se, se ter um effect test sem um price cost analysis? E, e, e a segunda pergunta é... Na medida em que a, a Europa decida ir para a linha do price cost analysis, uh, você não entende que ela estaria muito mais convergindo com o que é a prática americana, com a visão americana com relação a, 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 esses, a, esses, a essas condutas? E how long have we got? <laughs> well, look, um, I mean, there is so much to say there. Um, to start with, um, is this the EU? converging on the American approach. I'm very skeptical um, about the proposition that some people seem to have that uh, one just should be converging the US and the EU systems as though that is somehow an inherently good thing to do. Because I think there are so many things that are different about the American legal system, the history, the way that cases are litigated, the nature of the economy in the United States, um, which is profoundly different from Europe. This is big picture stuff for a moment, okay? Um, you often hear people saying that we in Europe use Article 102 systematically to attack American uh, companies in the IT sector because we're jealous because they're clever and we're not and that so that that's so <laughs> Intel Qualcomm Microsoft Google whatever well I, some of you have been to my recent developments lectures where I have a list of all the current article 102 cases that are being conducted by the European Commission um, I, I can read the list I've got a photographic memory the Czech rail organization the Lithuanian rail organization the Romanian gas company the Bulgarian gas, gas company um, an awful lot of the enforcement in the EU is actually against utilities recently demonopolized, liberalized, subject to sector-specific regulation in their own jurisdictions, where the national regulator is so weak that it can't take on the incumbent. And so at national level, nothing can be done about this abusive behavior, but Article 102 is either an overarching legal norm or an underarching safety net. You can put it either way. 
and Article 102 can be used to deal with those kind of situations. You wouldn't ever come to that kind of question in the United States because there are quite different ways of dealing with the electricity sector or whatever. And I can see that in the US you don't need an essential facilities doctrine in a way that we in Europe across 28 countries, still with very solid lumps of monopoly all over the place, we need an Article 102 that can address those kind of issues. So I don't believe that there's something good about convergence in and of itself. Secondly, abuse of dominance cases in, in the US are very often litigated privately between a claimant and a defendant with asymmetric cost structures, the possibility of treble damages, and an award that might feel terribly sorry for mum and pop that's being beaten up by this big bad domco. <laughs> Um, well, I can see how you, as a judge, where you don't have a prosecutorial discretion, you might want over the years to systematically raise the bar of the law to help to filter out claims that you don't really think should be there in the first place. That's profoundly different from the European system where things predominantly are publicly driven by authorities with a prosecutorial discretion. So again, I think there's just a vast difference between the US and the, that's not to criticize the US in any way, but I don't believe in convergence for the sake of convergence. That's point one. On the object effect thing and resale price maintenance, for example, um, and it's a dreadful misunderstanding of the European system, including by most Europeans, which is that if an agreement under Article 1011 has the object of restricting competition, that is simply a legal presumption. It, it's one nil to the competition authority. But then the defendant can come along and equalize and away goals score double sometimes by saying, yes, but it's an object restriction, but it leads to economic benefits. And specifically in the case of resale price maintenance, the commission's vertical guidelines says, I think it's paragraph 254, that they recognize that RPM may have efficiency enhancing effects. So, the fact that it is characterized at this stage as an object restriction does not mean that the agreement can't be justified. It's just that the burden of proof shifts to uh, the defendant. I don't have a difficulty with the idea of evidential burdens of proof going backwards and forwards. And I don't rule out that if there are a number of cases over a number of years in which competition authorities were persuaded, case by case by case, that RPM was actually more good than bad, then that moment will come when the Court of Justice will say, well, maybe this shouldn't be an object restriction at all, which happened in the States with Sylvania, for example. Um, but remember, the fact that something is an object restriction doesn't mean it can't be defended. If you're per se illegal under Section 1 of the Sherman Act, you're dead. That's it. There's nowhere left to go. So, you know, there, there, there's a structural difference between EU and US law. And people talk about uh, um, the Legion case in the United States. And it, any conference you go to in Europe, Legion is presented, a, there you are again, the, the Americans, they're ahead of us, you see. Rule of reason for RPM just shows how much more sophisticated they are, or how much more powerful Compass Lexicon and CRA has different ways of describing it. Um, <laughs> but um, what I would say is that um, Legion is US law catching up with the EU because RPM has never been per se illegal in the EU. It is an object restriction under 1011, but it can be defended under 1013. It has never been per se illegal. There's a PhD in this for someone, US EU competition law. <laughs> did, I, did that answer any of what you asked me? Oh, did it? Oh, good. <laughs> this question there. Rodrigo. Are you going to ask this question in English or Portuguese? No, no, but you do what you prefer, but it's just, do I have to put these on? That's I think that's in, in Portuguese is better. Portuguese. Yeah. In Portuguese, yes. Yeah. Uh, muito obrigado pelas explicações, professor. E uma, uma grande dúvida que eu tenho, e aí do ponto de vista tanto acadêmica quanto é, como profissional da área, é, quando, como eu faço em, em termos de padrão de prova 
para verificar se determinada conduta está afetando a competição no mérito ou eliminando um concorrente ineficiente. E aí uma, 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 uma pergunta ou uma uhum. colocação que eu gostaria de fazer é, se eu faço uma análise estática do mercado, talvez seja mais difícil é, essa constatação, essa prova. Agora, se eu faço uma análise é, dinâmica do mercado, onde eu tenho uma situação antes de uma conduta e uma situação posterior, será que é, eu não consigo separar com algum padrão de prova quando eu tenho um, 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 uma conduta que está eliminando é, concorrentes eficientes e, consequentemente, prejudicando a concorrência no mérito? Um exemplo se depois da conduta não, não houve novas entradas, é, os concorrentes não conseguiram aumentar a sua participação, vender mais, não houve redução de preço, mesmo com reduções de preço, etc. Então, essa é a minha dúvida. Sim. Hum. Yeah. Essa é uma pergunta muito boa. E eu acho que a resposta é que a resposta é que não há uma resposta simples, single answer I'm, I'm that you know well it, it, it sounds like the ultimate cop-out to say it all depends on the circumstances of the case but actually after what now feels like about 130 years in competition policy um, I have decided it depends on the circumstances of the case it goes back to something that uh, Bruno asked about do you have to do price cost analysis in every case well the first thing I wrote down here was um, of course every case of a of abuse can't be about price cost analysis because if I'm a dominant firm, if I'm Hoffman La Roche and I have 95% of the market for vitamin B, which I think they did in that case, and if they say to their customers, I am only going to supply vitamin B to you on condition that you purchase exclusively from me for 999 years. Now, as a lawyer, my instinct says, that could be exclusionary. I don't know where I get that from, but I just have this feeling it could be exclusionary. Do I have to ask the economist to do a price cost analysis? It just has no meaning, does it? I think in that kind of case, you actually have some rule, some rule of thumb that says, you know, anything more than two years, maybe anything more than a year is dodgy. And now the evidential burden flips to you because it just seems dodgy for, a do for somebody that dominant to be insisting on exclusivity even for five years. It smells a bit strange. You claim that there's an efficiency justification, but we're a competition authority. We don't know everything. We don't know the world of vitamin B. Tell us your story. Why is it going to be efficient for you? you know, are there going to be economies in production? Are you going to invest more? But the burden flips to Domco. So you don't need price cost analysis there. Uh, another example that comes to mind, some of you will know uh, the AstraZeneca case in Europe, where AstraZeneca had a patent that was running out, and there were systems at member state level where you could go to the local patent offices and say, we lost five years of our patent at the beginning because we didn't have a market authorization. Please extend our patent for five years. And this was essentially a form-filling exercise, not subject to third-party scrutiny. Um, and I think I can say this without being sued for libel. Um, AstraZeneca lied to 10 different patent offices across Europe as a result of which their patents were extended by five years. Well, a patent on a drug that's been extended for five years, by its nature, excludes the generics for five years. And that exclusion is nothing to do with efficient competitor, inefficient competitor. It's an exclusion by lying. So you don't need economic effects analysis in that case. On the other hand, I'm the airline, and I've just dropped my prices drastically, coincidentally just when the new airline entered the market. Well, I certainly would want to know now, is that airline that dropped its prices, 
Is it still washing its face and making a profit? Or is it making a loss? Because if it's making a loss, I am at a loss to know what it is doing other than predating. So I, I really do think that different abuses require different analysis. And on your static dynamic thing, I think that's a different point. I think that's about whether the competition authority has got the knowledge and the experience and the wisdom to distinguish cement from the never instant, the next instant messaging app, <laughs> where we know that overnight instant messenger can disappear because something else has arrived. Cement's not going to disappear overnight. So we just depend on competition authorities to be smart. And frankly, I, I don't, nothing tells me that competition authorities aren't smart. And there was a case a few years ago, what was it, Microsoft, um, Microsoft McAfee, I think, where the commission cleared the merger that almost gave them a 100% market share for a fleeting period of time. And the commission said, we're not worried, actually. This is a dynamic market. And then um, there was an appeal to the general court by um, Sun, I think it was. Um, no, Cisco, that's right, Cisco Systems. And the general court said, yeah, we're not, we're, we're quite relaxed about this. So I, authorities can distinguish a static market from a dynamic market, I think. Acho que a gente tem tempo para mais uma pergunta. Daniel. Daniel. Per pergunta é curta, fazer em português todo mundo está fazendo. Uh, cláusula de nação, nação mais favorecida, MFN clauses. Uh, qual a sua opinião, já que para essa questão especificamente a Europa se divide? Né? É, é possível trazer eficiências? Não é necessário? Qual a sua, qual, qual a sua visão sobre esse tipo de cláusula? Hum. Well, that is an interesting one, um, in the sense that uh, the, these things have always been floating around MFNs, and then for many, many years we didn't really hear any of anything about them. And now in the last three, four, five years, um, every authority in Europe seems to be doing MFN cases. Uh, so what do I think about them? Obviously, you're talking there specifically about the hotel online booking case, and I know that you're dealing with that in um, Brazil as well. Um, incidentally, I think we should drop the expression MFN. I think it's a hopelessly misleading clause that comes from the world of international trade and, and GATT and uh, the Havana Convention and all sorts of things. Um, I think parity clauses is really good. And we've recently had this Amazon case in Europe where the Commission said that Amazon was offering, was demanding price parity clauses and was also demanding non-price parity clauses. And I actually found just it's remarkable what language could, can do for you. When they started using the language parity clause, somehow it's as though everything focused and I kind of found it easier to understand. So I encourage you to think in terms of parity clauses. Obviously, in the hotel online booking case, um, it is clear across Europe that different authorities and different legislatures have different answers to this question. So there's a general recognition that um, you can um, forbid certain parity clauses, but query what about the hotel itself? Should the platform be able to say to the hotel, you can't offer lower prices? And there are different outcomes. Um, I have heard it suggested, and this may well be the case, that in Germany, the structure of the hotel market is actually very different from in other member states. And in other member states, you have you know, a strong presence of intercontinental and, and groups such as that. Whereas in Germany, when you go for your holiday in the Black Forest, you're going to stay at uh, Herr and Frau Schmidt's uh, little fam. But, but it, might, it might make a difference, and they do like their small and medium-sized businesses in, in Germany. That might just be a relevant national difference. But obviously there is some kind of doctrinal friction there. Not always a bad thing to have doctrinal friction, incidentally. 
Bill and I were talking at lunch today about how the European system might be a better system if the Court of Justice was allowed to permit dissenting judgments. Because often you learn more about the law from reading a dissenting judgment than you do from reading uh, the, the, the non-dissenting judgment, or worse still in Europe, a judgment signed by 15 people that no individual actually believes in. <laughs> That's not good. Um, so in a way, having had this doctrinal friction over several years uh, may not have been a bad thing because it brings the is issues out into the public. Um, and I, I suppose on that specific issue, the chances are that one day it will reach the Court of Justice level because that's why you have the Article 267 reference to Luxembourg, because then it can hand down a judgment that has to be applied uniformly, not on parity clauses, but we've just had an opinion from an advocate general by the name of Niels Vahl, remarkably enough, um, not on parity clauses, but on um, restrictions on online <laughs> sales through marketplaces, such as uh, Amazon and eBay. And um, that's where Coty in Germany imposes a ban on its distributors that you can't sell through third party marketplaces, but you can sell online yourself. Is that an object restriction? And it's gone up to the Court of Justice and three member states have argued that it is an object restriction. Two have argued that it's not an object restriction. The commission has argued that it's not an object restriction. And Val has said he doesn't think it's an object restriction, and I suspect by Christmas we'll get a court, a court of justice judgment, and they will say it's not an object restriction. But you've had all the creative debate has gone into it, and eventually there'll be a judgment. As to parity clauses more generally, I think it is very interesting because, of course, historically, the sense was that the parity clause was being imposed by the supplier on the distributor. Um, and now, of course, you've got the platforms that are very powerful that are imposing the parity clause on the supplier. And so new, new theories of harm have been discovered, as it were. And the recent Amazon case in Europe, I find completely convincing, where the Commission accepted Article 9 commitments, but its theory of harm was that these parity clauses were being imposed by Amazon on the e-publishers and that they were abusive of dominance. So um, I would say it's not as confused as you might think, but there is some confusion. And uh, let's wait see, and see what happens with the hotels. Okay. Professor, gostaria de gostaria de agradecer a brilhante apresentação feita. E, e contar com, com você aqui até pelo menos 2042, se a gente ainda estiver por aqui. Mas seria sempre um prazer tê-lo aqui. Obrigado. <risos>